Well, hello and welcome. We're going to be talking about writing LGBTQIA characters tonight. And with me, I've got a tremendous slate of authors who all write um, Melmo paranormal romance, uh, suspense, and science fiction with LGBTQIA characters, whole range of topics. So we're going to jump right in on how to do this, do it respectfully, do it right. And maybe how to write something that you're not because everybody can't be everything. So eventually, unless you only write one kind of person, you're gonna write somebody that isn't exactly like you. How do you do it right? How do you do it respectfully? How do you do it um, while avoiding all those, you know, stereotypes that nobody wants to use in their writing. So I'm gonna jump in and have the panel introduce themselves starting with Pandora. Hi everybody, I'm Pandora Pine. I've written over 50 MM romance novels over the last five years, and I'm very happy to be here. Awesome. Lucy? I'm Lucy Lennox, and uh, I can't believe you've written that much already. I <laughs> was like, <laughs> wow. Um, I have been doing this for four years, and I want to say I have around 30 books, um, and I, too, write MM romance. Michael? Michael G. Williams. I have been published since 2012. I think I've written eight books or something like that. I can't imagine having written 30, much less 50. And I mostly write horror, urban fantasy, and science fiction, but it always has queer main characters and queer perspective characters. Great. Maggie? I'm the newbie. I started publishing in 2018 with SCC Books, Divine Destinies. And to date, I think I have um, six novels and six short stories. I think, I, I'm not too sure. I'm not great, great with remembering things. So, And I write romance starring Canada's Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Hank. Hi, I'm Hank Edwards, and I've been writing for a really long time. Um, and you'd think I'd have more books, but I don't. I have about 35 novels, um, and I've got a bunch of short stories and some short story collections, and I write mostly gay romance. A lot of times it tends to skid off into paranormal, so I also have some rom-coms. Even anything like I write is usually has some sassy characters in it being smart alex. so. Great. And I'm Gail C. Martin and Morgan Bryce as Gail C. Martin. I write epic fantasy, urban fantasy, steampunk, near future, post-apocalyptic, and more. And as Morgan Bryce, I write urban fantasy, male, male, paranormal romance. I've been doing it for a while now, somewhere around 40 books and been in about 40 anthologies. Um, after a while, you just kind of lose track. But uh, a lot of broad range of characters and, and try to keep it that way. So let's uh you know let's dive into the question of what when you are reading fiction or watching a tv show or a movie that has lgbtqia characters what are the kinds of things that stand out to you as maybe something that script writers writers uh should steer clear of. Maybe um, it's overdone, maybe it's inaccurate, uh, maybe it feeds into negatives, but what do you wish people would quit doing? Killing them off. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Number but one. Sorry, on I had camera. to jump in and say it, sorry. No, mm -hmm. start with you, Hank, go ahead. Yeah, kill, I mean, the, there's the trope, right? Bury the gays. <laughs> Bury your gays, and, and it, it happens in TV shows. I mean, it's, it's always, um, you know, they introduce a gay character in a series and it's happened to so many series. I, I, you know, and of course I can't think of one right now, but um, well, Star Trek Discovery, Discovery. I think. Yeah, Discovery, right? And, um, and it's, they'll introduce the character. It seems like they're taking time to, for you to get to know them. And then all of a sudden, you know, and, and you know, why can't the gays be happy? <laughs> Seriously. So, yeah. Maggie. Let them be the stars. I find, um, you know, um, when I watch um, TV, I don't watch a lot of TV, just period murder mysteries. Um, but I find um, they're never the stars. Why, why can't we have a star? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I, I would enjoy writing, uh, reading that or uh, watching it. I just recently watched, um, I think it was called American 
something. It wasn't horror, but it, it was really well done. Uh, it was um, a lesbian couple and they were um, the stars of that one story because they have different storylines and they did a really good job portraying um, that and mental illness. It, it was mm -hmm. really well done. And I thought, wow, it'd be so nice to see more of this mm -hmm. uh, instead of just, you know, they're, they're always secondary characters. Mm -hmm. Michael. I have like 14 different answers of things I wish people would stop doing. Um, go, go for it because we, we have plenty to talk about. Okay. First up, stop making us just like everybody else. That sounds like, uh, I don't know, that maybe sent maybe a lot, maybe more of us wish that we could be just like everybody else in fiction. But I, I don't like when queer characters, uh, when their queerness just doesn't matter when it's completely invisible and it just doesn't affect their lives. Not everything has to be about the traumas that queer people endure, but their queerness needs to matter in some way. Uh, and speaking of Star Trek Discovery, I think that uh, that Stamets and, and Wilson Cruz's character, whose name just left me, uh, they're a character, they're a couple whose characters' queerness matters and they're characters who experience trauma, but their trauma is not about being queer which is really what I'm looking for. I mm -hmm. want for our queerness to matter, but I want us to stop getting bashed on camera. I want us to stop dying of AIDS. And I want us to stop being perfect characters whose horrible tragedies illustrate how everybody should have been nicer to us before we died. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Luce, and, and save those that I was counting, Michael, that's only four. So I'm counting on you to bring okay. up 10 more later on in, in the panel, okay? I'm, I'm <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Lucy. Um, yeah, my, I mean, one of mine is sort of tease off that a little bit. It's, it's not having their story revolve around, you know, their sexuality, their sexual orientation, like whatever, their sexual identity and not, you know, not having that always be what their, what the gay character story is about. If there's a gay character, his story is about being gay usually. But my biggest thing probably is more on page on screen, in this case, romance, where it doesn't fade to black. It doesn't, they don't avoid PDA. They don't, and it's a fine line because Michael, while you were talking, I was thinking about, you know, a lot of these things are a fine line, you know, because um, you don't want to ignore the reality. It's not like, you know, you could walk through small town Alabama having PDA, you know, on screen and have that be believable. But at the same time, you know, there are a lot of us out there who wish that were the case. So depending on mm -hmm. what the movie is, you know, let us see that same kind of affection in an LGBT couple that you would in any kind of straight couple in the same situation. We don't see that. Even the most, you know, open-minded, so to speak, shows that are out there who are like, oh, these great, you know, characters, these great diverse characters, they're still chopping those scenes off in a much more conservative way. So that's one of my biggest things. Okay, Pandora? Well, what Lucy said made me think of the show Pose. And they had an amazing scene last season with uh, Billy Porter's character. And they almost went all the way on camera. And we absolutely need to see more of those kind of things. And it also makes me think too about the way that gay people are often portrayed as villains. You know, I, I think of Thomas on Downton Abbey. I mean, he was a jerk, no doubt about it. But he wasn't a jerk because he was gay. He was just a jerk. You know, and I think we're coming a little bit further in that realm where, you know, they're not always the bad guy or the bad girl, but there's still a long, long way to go with that. Yes to everything. Um, I think probably one of mine is also that you tend to often see LGBTQIA characters still inhabit various, very stereotypical behavior. Um, either they're a twink, like a flamboyant twink, like Jack on Will and Grace, or they're the very buttoned up Will, or they're the, um, you know, lesbian with a pickup truck and a flannel shirt. It's, it's a bunch of stereotypes. These aren't real people. And so 
I love to see it when more often I see it in books than on uh, TV, but I'm starting to see a few things uh, elsewhere, especially on cable, where the guy might be slightly built, but he's a badass and he's not, you know, trailing a feather boa and, you know, being, being what the stereotype often forces a character into. So I like to see that range, just like we have for everybody else, where, you know, you, you can be more than two or three kinds of characters. <laughs> Let's have some reality here. Yeah. When it comes to writing characters that um, may match where you are, maybe outside your personal experience, because as I said in the beginning, we can't all be everything. So at some point you're gonna write somebody who isn't just like you. How do you go about portraying that accurately and realistically and respectfully? Pandora? You know, when I was 12, I read, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. And the book stunned me because that little girl was me. You know, and at the time, I never really gave a whole lot of thought um, to the fact that, you know, it didn't help, you know, young women of color. It didn't help young women who may think the girls in her class were the attractive ones rather than the boys, or even the girls who thought both were attractive. And for me, it's the visibility. You know, I, I want my characters to, you know, have strong moral cores and be fun people, you know, because it, you know, being gay, it, it isn't all about being gay all the time. You go to the grocery store, you, you know, you go out with friends, you know, you have a life beyond that one part of yourself. And I think everybody has that one part of themselves that they maybe keep a little bit on the down low. And that's how I manage to connect with my characters because there's parts of me that even all these decades later, no one knows about. And that, that's where my characters come from is that fear in me that if you know about this one thing or this other thing, that no one will be my friend again. So that's where my characters come from. Lucy? Yeah, I mean, I think the two things that help me the most are, um, first of all, reading. I mean, reading lots of different people's experiences, fiction and nonfiction, um, and just trying to get into a lot of different characters' heads because there's so many um, different lived experiences, like you said, that, that have to do with all kinds of nuances that we have. So for me, reading is a biggie. Um, but then also, you know, looking around to the people in your life and, and, you know, seeing how, you know, how different and varied and nuanced are the people that I surround myself with. Because I think that, that oftentimes people who are trying to write characters who are different from themselves, if they surround themselves with everybody who's the same as they are, they're not going to have as, as easy of a time because, you know, they're not friends with anybody who's different with them. They don't actually sit down, you know, at the neighborhood park or whatever and talk to somebody who has a completely different experience. Let's say you're both parents with the kids in the same school, but there's something about maybe that other family has learning challenges and your kids don't have the same learning challenges. If you befriend that person and talk to them and ask them questions about their experience and their struggles and their challenges, because you care about getting to know your neighbors and having, you know, interesting people in your life, you just by virtue of being a, a, I mean, and not everybody has an easy time being a people person, but I have a fairly easy time, but you know, that, that to me is how you broaden your horizons, start to understand better other people's lived experiences. And hopefully the characters that you're writing come from having real friends in the real world who do have some of those experiences, no matter, you know, what it is about them, whether it's a hobby they have, whether it's, you know, their sexual identity, their race, their, you know, they're, they're an indigenous, you know, person of Canada. Like, you know, if you're friends with them, that, that gets you so much further along than trying to piece it together through some kind of like online research or something. Mm -hmm. Michael? 
I <clears throat> I take a couple of different approaches to it. I, for instance, in one of my series right now, one of the main characters is non-binary. I have no experience of being that. I'm very comfortable as a cisgendered man. And <clears throat> so I was very concerned about misrepresenting that experience when writing it, particularly because I'm a cisgendered white dude. I am just larded up in privilege that I am not aware of. And I was really worried that I would misstep in some significant way. So one thing I did was go looking for non-binary criticisms of other artifacts of popular culture. Like what were non-binary people saying about the representation that they saw or didn't see and what did they wish they could see so that I could try to get a little of their firsthand experience of being consumers of culture. And then I also in like accounts of non-binary identities, I tried to look for like, where are the ways that their experience intersects with mine? And so like, how can I try to reframe my own experiences in that way and thus like speak authentically, but also speak from what I hope is an accurate representation of their perspective. And partly this is probably because I've written more horror than anything, but uh, I, in my experience, a lot of the commonality of queer identities experiences is fear. You know, we each have experiences in our lives or circumstances in our lives that make us more afraid than other circumstances. And those circumstances are different for different identities within sort of the rainbow. But, and they're different from the experiences that, uh, you know, that a woman has or that a person of color has that make them afraid. But that was a way that I was able to think about, okay, if I were a non-binary person, what circumstance that they're describing that you know, makes them feel vulnerable is news to me. And how can I like try to think through that? Um, I, you know, at Dragon Con, I was one of the writers in the writer's mentoring program. And in that, uh, an African-American man said to me, I want to talk to you about writing queer characters because I'm worried that I'll misrepresent them. And I said, okay, here's the thing you need to keep in mind. My experience is not like yours. And if I ever claim that it is, then I am lying through my teeth. But you and I have the same enemies. And those enemies are trying to keep us down in some of the same ways and almost always for the same reasons. And if you approach it from that angle, you can get a lot of what we've both got going on in our lives and you can approach it respectfully that way. That's just how I tend to approach things. Okay, Maggie. What was the, the question again exactly? How do you write characters who may be something you're not and do it accurately and respectfully? Because everybody can't be everything. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, when I'm developing a character, um, I first write them as a person. Being an indigenous woman, um, I'm a person first. Do, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then um, being Ojibwe uh, from a reserve, um, that then starts playing an effect in, in, into your life. And it would be the same thing for uh, my character, say, Billy from Two Princes, uh, who is uh, bisexual and he's from a reserve. But now how does that affect him? So, you know, he, he's a character first. And then uh, how how being who he is, uh, besides being Ojibwe, also being two-spirit, uh, how that affects him. So basically that, that's how it all plays plays into, and his background too as well. Okay, Hank. Um, there's been a lot of good answers and pretty much the way I approach <laughs> a character is is kind of like a combination of, of all of that. And a lot of times it's like kind of like what Maggie said, uh, the character comes through first, um, kind of like how, uh, how they respond to situations, how they react to situations. And then I sort of build a history off of that. And, um, and then I, I do base characters a lot on, on people that I know or people that I've met. And uh, I tend to just like, kind of like steal little bits and pieces from, from people that I know um, and have known in the past. And it could be from a long time ago. So no one is safe. And um, I think that um, that kind of helped me form, you know, an actual believable person just because it's actually based on someone who is living and breathing. 
Um, but then I throw in, you know, a lot of different crazy stuff as well. You know, like, oh yeah, and he's a werewolf. So. <laughs> I think for me, it's, it's a combination of a lot of the things we've talked about. Um, part of it is I'm, I love to get into late night conversations with people at the bar or at conventions when we have those. And yes, I'm having a wonderful conversation, but my writer brain is going on, what am I learning here? What, what, what am I gaining from this that I can, you know, learn and know more than I did when I started this conversation? And so uh, having those conversations with as broad a group of people as you can, uh, like Lucy said, it is invaluable. Um, I try to read widely from authors that get good marks for uh, representing people accurately so that what I'm seeing is, um, is setting a good example and teaching me uh, correctly instead of reinforcing maybe negative stereotypes or, or negative um, misunderstandings. And I subscribe to, I don't know, about a dozen LGBTQ magazines and news channels because I want to understand what is going on in the community to understand, like Michael said, um, where are the winds, where is the fear, where is the danger, that that all informs how you live your life and how you make your choices. And I can't know that if I don't understand what's going on. And then I also try to make sure that my beta readers are representative of the community that I'm writing about. Um, so that if I'm going to use a character of a certain uh, collection of traits, whatever those traits are, I've got somebody at least at least several people who can come back and say, you got it wrong, you got it right. Uh, you know, and, and everybody, no one person can speak for an entire group of people. It's tricky. That part is tricky, I have found. It is because no, it's wrong to ask a single person to speak for an entire group, but it's also impossible for one person to try to speak for an entire group. The best you can do is kind of try to get several people and see where they match up and then go, if they're all saying the same thing, I bet that, I bet that part is right. Um, and then mining my own experience for any kind of commonality um, where I haven't walked in somebody's shoes, I can look for the closest pair of shoes I've got mm -hmm. and go, okay, I haven't had that experience, but I've had this other experience that's like it in many ways. Can I cross over with empathy for how that would feel with these other aspects as well? And, um, and then you kind of have to let it go in the air because every, as, as you guys all know, you write something and it gets filtered through every reader's personal lens of experience and will end up meaning to them things you never envisioned, yeah. good, bad, and otherwise. There's also a huge difference between reality and mm -hmm. fiction. I mean, there's some things that are very, real like especially in gay romance that still like that that we still don't put in romance novels because they're romance novels there are things about you know being a, a woman with a menstrual cycle that we don't put in romance novels it's very true to the lived experience we don't put it in a romance novel so um, i think that's a tricky area too you know Boy, that comes up where people you know you'll see people go well this wasn't entirely accurate because you didn't do you know these things and you're going well it's a romance novel um kind like of open relationships is a big one in gay romance you know mm -hmm. open relationships and and the and the types of relationships and the types of hookup culture there's there's all kinds of things that are that are so that the sex positivity there's so many facets to to you know writing about gay males falling in love that you it, that like it and I'll be curious to see how this changes in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. But right now, a lot of those things, if you, you can put them in a novel all day long, but that novel is not necessarily going to sell or it's not necessarily going to get good reviews or the readers are going to freak out or, you know, I mean, it's that I find interesting between, you know, balancing that lived accurate experience um, and, and 
try, you know, and, and also trying to write a fictional novel. Um, Even something as granular as getting the prep right, mm -hmm. which also happens in het romance. We don't generally stop and describe everything that would make for a better experience. Um, <laughs> And there's a, there's a balance there because you don't want somebody who is knowledgeable to go, ouch, no, no, <laughs> not like that. Right. But at the same time, there are things that aren't quite as um, glamorous right. that go into making it work that tend to get skipped over. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's that, it's that balancing line of who are you writing for? What kind of book is it? And uh, what experience does the reader want out of this story? And, and, and remind you, go ahead. You're not teaching. This is not a class. This is not a sex ed class. This is a romance book. Right. Right. Sorry, Michael. Go ahead. Oh no, no, no. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, no, I, I think that just so much of it ultimately comes down to what emotional experience do you want the reader to be having here? We can't control their reaction but we can certainly write in a way to try to guide them towards a certain spectrum of emotional responses. And, and if what we want them to do is have a, a moment of sort of, uh, of heartwarming revelation versus a moment of horrified revelation, we're gonna tell different parts. Even if the plots are more or less the same, we're gonna focus on different aspects of, that and of those experiences to try to push them towards those emotional ends. Mm -hmm. Hank, you looked like you were about to Ah, okay. No, um, I, I mean, I agree. Like, oh. I want to come back to something Pandora brought up, which is the long habit in fiction of tagging the villain um, and all the historic things that have been glommed on to that um, shorthand way of making somebody the bad guy. If you think about it in the old radio dramas, the guy always dragged his foot because that way you could hear him coming on the radio where you couldn't see anybody. But that's very disrespectful uh, to people with physical disabilities. Why would somebody suddenly be a killer just because they've got a bad foot? So we end up with a lot of those old negative tags sometimes thrown in. And we see it, unfortunately, even in newly produced work, how do we, um, how do we steer clear of that? Does this mean we can never have a gay person as a villain or is there a way to do it that isn't pejorative for, it has nothing to do with their orientation. They're just, have, this, this is a bad person as opposed to a good person. How do, how do we do, um, how do we create villains for our fiction without, um, vilifying real people. Hank. Oh, geez. <laughs> well, you have this horned god thing. I do, I'm tomorrow, like, because. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, all, it's all about, you know, the, the characterization and it. it's just like the motivation. And that's where you have to, as the author, you have um, the responsibility to, to, delve into the character's psyche and make them a, um, how do I want to put it? Not a sympathetic villain, but an understandable villain. You can make it sympathetic, but that could get scary. Um, and and um, explain their motivation in a way that doesn't have to do with their sexuality. And that can just be like, you know, a side note and that would be very and refreshing. Every villain is the hero of their own tale. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And you just have to find what they're what they believe they're doing right and why they're doing that. And then you kind of have to buy into that yourself, right? Even if you, even if they're a villain, you kind of as the author, you got to be like, yeah, this is this guy's right, you know. So, Maggie, answer the question. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. Um. That's that's a good question. Um. I was just thinking on that. Um, because I write about Indigenous people, we um, don't look too much into villains. Um, we're about balance, not good, not evil, always balance. We, we get that from nature because there's no good and evil in nature. 
And I find um, uh, when I do write a villain, I, he's not a villain or she's not a villain to me. They're more or less people with um, different motives that can be a little bit too intense or uh, leaning more towards off what I call off balance, where they're not balanced. And, they're, it, and it stems from their, their backgrounds. I always go back into their backgrounds. Uh, because with the one villain, oh, that, that villain word, um, I have in, um, it, it's actually a heterosexual novel, but he is um, uh, basically traumatized uh, through the residential schools. And um, so that is what motivates him to do the things that he does in the novel. So he's an Ojibwe character. And uh, see here, I, I can write someone who isn't all good, but who also has problems. So uh, like I said, I, I don't really write villains or, or horror or anything. I write romance, so I, it's kind of hard to touch on. But like I said, um, it all goes back to their background and what's, and what's motivating them and, and what they want. And this man wants revenge uh, against what, what's happened to him. And he blames Western society on it. And what they're trying to find throughout that whole novel is balance uh, against the, the two families that are feuding. Uh, that, that's basically where, where I come from is, yeah, the, their background. Mm -hmm. Michael. I have an unpopular opinion about <laughs> queer villains, which is that I love them and I want more of them and I want every villain to be queer <laughs> because villainy is inherently queer and I love it. Every villain wants what they want and the world has told them they shouldn't have that thing they want. And they have said, you know what? The world can take a hike because I'm gonna get what I want. And that's a very queer story. And so I love queer coded villains. I want them openly queer. The only thing complaint I have is that they're queer coded. Um, that said, I want their motivation for being a villain to be something other than their queerness. Almost mm -hmm. every villain is traumatized Ultimately, their villainy comes from some trauma in their past. If they're like at all sympathetic and understandable villains. I mean, there's always, as a horror writer, there's always room to say, well, I don't know, it's just evil, which kind of feels lazy, but, uh, but you know, it's there as an option. But if we're supposed to sympathize with them at all, then that needs to come from a place of trauma. And that trauma doesn't have to be about them also being queer characters. What I would love is more work in which the villain is queer and the protagonists are queer. And that's part of the tension between them because everybody knows that the villain and the hero are a little into each other. And I find that very appealing as a reader. Okay, Lucy. Um, I, uh, I love that by the way. Um, and, and in my stories, everybody's gay, so it's fine. That works out just perfectly, but um, they're not really, but it, sometimes it feels like it. I think for me, um, I actually try, I, I do try, I ascribe to the thought of every villain is the hero of his own tale. He has to have a motivation for what he's doing or she is doing. And you have to understand that. And I agree about, you know, not making that about um, that part of them. But I think one of the way, for me, the closest I come to writing a true villain, which I usually try and stay away from is homophobic characters in my books when I use them, which is not often to me are are unredeemable like I, I there's some readers who are like when are we going to get so-and-so story I'm like never because I don't I'm not going to spend any time on them because uh, it get you know it gets to me when I when I write that for whatever reason but um but I think for me the way you you write that character in a way where you can have a queer villain is building trust with the reader that you have <laughs> a lot of well-rounded characters of all kinds. And so that having your villain, you know, in, in my books, be a gay man or well, whatever, a lesbian, whatever they are, that that's incidental because we've seen all of these, you know, non-evil characters or good characters that also are. So if, I guess that's what I'm saying. I think you build readers trust with having a lot of queer characters so that when they see a, a queer villain, okay, that's like, well, we've seen great queer characters also who are very good. Um, but I also think it comes back to what we've talked about already, which is just in general, writing very well-rounded characters. 
um, who don't have just one aspect be the thing about them. I mean, I think if you write a flat villain, that's when you have a problem because then you don't understand their motivation. Pandora. You know, when it comes to romance, usually the people that you see cast in that sort of a role, you know, is an ex, an ex lover, an ex, you know, spouse or whatever. But you know what, if you take a look at it from the spouses or the ex-boyfriend's point of view, they're just as right as the other person on the other side, you know, in their own mind. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to come at it from that way where, you know, without making them seem like they're stalkers or like they're creepers or anything like that. But I also write a lot of, you know, the, the detective paranormal kind of stories. And the one thing that I always make sure to do is that the actual villains, you know, I had this Italian mob boss in one book and he knew that my characters were openly gay, but that didn't matter to him. He, he still needed to get revenge for, you know, the, the mistake made against him. And it didn't matter to him, gay, straight, whatever, that was what he was going to do. And, you know, it, I think it, it hurts when, when you start hurling, you know, those kinds of words at characters and, you know, like Lucy said, when you have homophobic people in your book, because it's, it's not the, it's not what I'm trying to give people, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't want people walking away thinking that I can write really good, bad characters like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think since I write urban fantasy, male, male, paranormal romance, some of mine get more on that darker magic side and, and some of the scarier stuff and some of them are lighter and fluffier. And then on the other side, it's non-romance or minor, minor romance, but mostly the action adventure and magic. And I've, I've always tried to first think when I'm creating a villain, start with first do no harm. Is my villain going to further anybody's mistaken negative stereotype? Um, because all some people in some places may know of any group is what they've seen on TV or read. And if they get a constant drumbeat of, oh, look, the, the um, you know, the burglars are always this kind of person or the, you know, killers are always this kind of person. If they don't know any people in real life, that makes them very vulnerable to believing things that real bad people would have them believe. And I know one of the big controversies that's going on right now in the science fiction community is the remake of Dune that's coming up and Baron von Harkonnen, who in the original 1970s novel isn't just gay, he's also a pedophile. And so how do you do a remake of this movie and recode the villains so that you aren't perpetuating that kind of damaging, inaccurate stereotype? And so that's kind of where I start is, um, don't be doomed. How can I create a villain who is bad for his own reasons, but isn't going, nobody's going to take away some bad thought about a whole group of people because I made a character that looked he's, like this. He's a villain to the character and not the reader is basically. Yes, yes. I don't want to ever feed any of those misperceptions and, and um, stereotypes. And I agree with you, Lucy, you know, on, on the, um, the negative language, I'll, I'll say something like, if, if it has to come up, I'll say something that somebody muttered an epithet under their voice, you know, under their Oh breath. yeah, yes. So I, don't, I don't have to use the word. Everybody knows what words they used. Mm -hmm. That's a DNF um, for me if I come across that. Like that's, I agree. I think that's important. I think that's important for this discussion. If other mm -hmm. authors are watching and trying to learn how to, to write, you know, various characters with respect, you need to be aware of those characters reading the book and seeing, you know, th like what we're talking about stereotypes and, and villainous, you know, stereotypes, but also just that language, that language that can stop you, you know, and, and harm you while you're reading to escape, which most, which is what most of us are doing. I think that's a really important part of that discussion. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, and that's one way around it to flag, here's somebody who said something they shouldn't have said, but we don't need to know the details. We just know that they said it. Mm-hmm. I think to some degree, it depends on for whom are you writing the story. Mm -hmm. And 
like I know that that's a very difficult task for me anyway to to always have in mind like who is my ideal reader because readers are of all identities and so it's sort of impossible but if I'm writing a story where the point is to demonstrate something about the queer experience to people who are outside of those experiences then it's possible that I would leave in something a little more shocking because I think that those people might need to be aware that things like that can happen. But if I'm writing it with the ideal reader being somebody within the queer communities, I'm gonna leave that out because I don't want to re-traumatize people. Mm -hmm. It's the genre too, I mean, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, obviously if you're writing a coming of age story and that's partner, you know, somebody has run into those negatives and that's part of what shaped them, you're more likely, and it's not romance, right. you're more likely to include some of those edgier experiences than when people read romance, like Lucy said, to escape. Mm -hmm. Maggie, anything you want to add to this whole thing from the Indigenous perspective, writing as about characters that are both Indigenous and um, LGBTQIA and running into horrible people for two reasons. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure, sure what you mean exactly. Any, any, we're kind of talking about, again, things not to do, but also how to, how to be authentic with that and, and acknowledge that there are negatives and bad things that happen without, cre without writing in something that's going to trigger somebody who's reading from their own experience. Oh, that, that's a good question. Um, with, uh, with the one novel I'm doing right now, um, I do um, uh, touch on that um, where they're living right now and um, is, 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 is a, on the, the homophobic side. Um, so, and the one character um, is in the closet be, because of that. Um, and where he does make mention of something, um, I turned it around so so it, it wouldn't be so traumatizing. Where it, I used his point of view instead. Um, it, it was about a slogan on, on a T-shirt that that some hair metal guy wore, and um, and he says he feels like it was being directed at him. That 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 way uh, people don't feel. Um, when you bring up that the, those type of words uh, in a book, uh, I, I even use it myself with, with Indigenous people. Uh, Boggin, for example, is is a very bad slang word, um, and I use it uh, just to portray that somebody is being um, racist and uh, in, in, in a bad way. Same with squaw, that word. I've used that as well. Um, to, and just to let them know that the, the person is being very, very disrespectful, that the, these words will will crop up in my work. But it's it's through the, the point of view character on how they react to it. So that way the, the reader doesn't feel like um, they're being, you know, pointed at or, or feel like um, they're, they're being impacted by, by those words. It's, it's actually about how the characters are uh, feeling ab about it. it what, what, is, what, was that what you were looking for exactly? Yeah, exactly. So, those, 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 those type of words, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I, I don't shy away from them because they're used every, in everyday life. Um, they're, they're a part of us. We hear them all the time. We see them on Facebook everywhere. Um, and ju just to let people know that um, how, how it does uh, affect others when they see that. And I, I think it's kind of a good thing that the character shows how they react to that, that, that those, those words used in fiction and how, and how it makes them feel. And it also helps with the story and reaffirms, you know, why somebody is in the closet and won't come out, you know, it, it basically um, builds on their character that um, he sees this happening on television where some rock star is, is wearing that label and, and he's a teenager and, and he's deeply affected by it when he sees that or, you know, um, uh, d d different other types of meetings or that. And it just basically, again, reaffirms why he is so fearful about, about uh, leaving that, that shell he's built around himself. Awesome. Thank you. 
Believe it or not, the hour has flown. Is there anything anybody didn't get to say that you've just been dying this whole hour to say and I didn't know to ask? Anybody? All right. Well, then let's tell everybody where they can find you online. Um, Pandora? Um, you can find me um, at Pandora Pine on um, Facebook. Uh, my readers group is Pandora's Box 11. And um, you can find all of my books on Amazon. Awesome. Lucy? You can find me at lucylennox.com. Uh, all of my books are on Amazon. And I have a really fun reader group on Facebook called Lucy's Lair. Cool. Michael? I am at www.michaelgwilliamsbooks.com. You can also find me on Facebook as Michael G. Williams Author. And you can follow me on Twitter where I'm just sort of wildly political as at McManley Pants, which is right back here. And you can also sign up for my newsletter at bit.ly slash NGW newsletter. Cool. Maggie? You can find me at maggieblackbird.com. Uh, I, I have no readers group. <laughs> just uh, <laughs> check out my blog. <laughs> I do a lot of blogging every day. So, But you do have a blog, so... Kudos there. An author page, yeah. yeah. Yes. Hank. I have a website, uh, hankedwardsbooks.com. I'm on Facebook, and I have a reader group in Facebook. It's a little small right now, but, you know, we're close-knit. It's called uh, Hank's Hangout. And uh, all of my books are available on Amazon. Quite a few of them are in Kindle Unlimited. Very good. And I'm findable at galezmartin.com. Remember the Z, that's important. And at morganbrice.com, B-R-I-C-E. My Gail and Gail and Larry uh, reader group is Shadow Alliance. My Morgan group is the world of Morgan Bryce. And if you look for some variation of those names, you'll find me on just about every social media platform. I'm pretty easy to spot, as well as here in Continual. Thank you all so much for sharing your evening with us and for a terrific conversation on the topic. Thank you folks for watching and stay tuned. We'll have a lot more coming here for you in continual. See you online.